Hi everyone, welcome to August. The last few weeks have been hot and humid. Perfect weather for us to sit by the water of a pool or a beach. That's exactly what my family and I did last week. We spent a week of vacation enjoying the amazing sights of North Middlesex and Lambton Shores. We camped at the Pinery Provincial Park and got to witness beautiful world-class sunsets over the sparkling waters of Lake Huron. I'm starting to sound a bit like a tourism commercial, right? Oh well, we got to spend time in this beautiful place, so why not brag a little bit? Last week, as restrictions relaxed a bit, we started GBC's Backyard Home Groups. About 40 of you got to connect with one another in five different locations. I really hope that more of you will join us. Let me know if you're interested. As I heard from some of you, it was a great time to catch up and hear each other's stories. As we spend time together, we hope that we'll get closer to God and get to know each other on a deeper level. Our goal for our backyard home groups is to connect our community and to provide opportunities for spiritual growth as we talk and share life together. In addition to our backyard home groups, we are looking forward to restarting church at the chapel soon. We are hoping that within a few weeks, we'll have the resources, the volunteers, and all the protocols ready for us to safely and effectively restart Church at the Chapel and to also continue our Church at Home through our live stream. So starting today, as you've, I'm sure, noticed, we'll be recording our messages right here live at the Chapel. But soon, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share this moment with some of you live and some of you in your own homes. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment as we worship you together. Thank you for this opportunity that we have each week for us to pray, for us to listen to your word, for us to just share moments together. Lord, we pray right now for those who are struggling, struggling emotionally, physically, financially. Lord, we pray for those who in this moment feel lonely or unloved. Lord, be with them. Protect us, Lord. Help us to support one another and to care for one another. Today, as we worship you, Lord, we pray for your spirit to be freely moving among us, regardless where we are. Lord, help us to be the church as you want us to function and act as your people. Be with us today, we pray, through your spirit, in Jesus' name. Speak to us. Amen. Amen. Let's worship our God together.
Grace Bible Chapel. This morning's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. That's Acts 6, verses 1 to 7. It says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenic Jews among them complained to the Arabic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn the responsibility of this over to them and give our full attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. In verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicoandor, Timon, and Permenus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. If you're just joining us, I'm so glad that you are here spending this time together with us. GBC's Church at Home is a great opportunity for us to be united despite these times of separation and isolation. I'm so glad you're here. Despite the draw of nearby beaches, parks, and other summer activities, we're sending you all virtual hugs, which soon, I hope, will be replaced by waves, and then in a bit, hopefully soon as well, handshakes and hugs. Today, we are continuing our teaching series in Acts. Over the past few weeks, we've had a few guest speakers. We had Jacob Wilmsey with us, Philip Bruce, and Pastor Brian, who did an excellent job leading us and challenging us to be more active in the calling of Jesus in unique ways. It's so easy to allow our challenges, our indecisions, fears, and even traditions to stop us from joining in what God has planned for us, in what he is doing around us. But as we'll see today, even in challenges, we find amazing opportunities for God's mission to grow. As we move into chapter 6, we'll find new challenges in the ministry of the early church. If you have been following this series, you have noticed that I'm kind of a fan of the early church. It's hard to dismiss the proximity to Jesus, their purity of devotion, their generosity, their spiritual power, and their faithfulness. Those were truly unprecedented times in church history. If you're like me, it's not hard to get excited about the narrative of the descent of the Holy Spirit as we reflected on chapter 2. It is inspiring to read about Peter and John's healing of a crippled man, or even noticing their courage and boldness that they displayed when they were faced with the, the religious leaders. 
in chapter 4 and 5, we find what I, what I consider the apex of the early church. If you recall, the early church is described as a united, committed, and generous community of believers who shared everything that they had. It's really hard to ignore the work of God's Spirit among them. They were truly a powerful witness of the good news of the resurrected Jesus, in word and deed. They truly took care of the needs, both spiritual and physical, of all those among them. But it's easy to romanticize this period of the church history. I confess that sometimes I do this. Those were the days, my friend, I thought they never end. You know the song, right? Uh, maybe some of you remember it. But the thing is, life goes on. Time has a way of not stopping even when we want it to. And this is true even when we consider the golden age of the church. As we continue reading and we know from history, those were the beginning of pains, of growing pains for the early church. As we've seen in previous uh, chapters of Acts, the early church had experienced external opposition from the religious system of the day. But internal challenges also started to emerge as greed and deceit infected some of its members, as we read in chapter 5, the narrative of Ananias and Sapphira. As we keep on reading on chapter, uh, in chapter 6, I should say, we find trouble brewing because of the church's ever-expanding, diverse, social-cultural setting. This faithful and generous community starts to be shaken by hurt feelings between the Hellenistic Jews and those who maintained their Jewish culture and identity. So what is a Hellenistic Jew, you may be asking yourself. In those days, Greek culture was not only popular, but it was still very much highly influential. While the Roman Empire put an end to Greek domination, known as the Hellenistic period, Greek influence was everywhere. The arts, literature, theater, architecture, music, mathematics, philosophy, and science. The movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding is a good parody of this. I won't spoil it. You're going to have to watch it yourself. The thing is... Greek language, both written and spoken, was the standard and it continued to be used throughout the Roman Empire. As many of you know or may remember, the New Testament manuscripts were written in Greek, which is a joy, of course, for seminary students. And this really is the context of this passage as the church was flourishing and growing. The universal good news of God's love was reaching a variety of people of different backgrounds and cultural settings. Yet, even in the beauty of this, we start to find challenges. Luke in Acts chapter 6 verse 1 describes how in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic or Greek Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. In the midst of this community described as a united, committed, and generous community of believers who shared everything they had, we find mistrust, division, and perceived cultural bias. As we'll see later, the apostles weren't intentionally ignoring widows, much less Greek widows. But as the church grew, the apostles' lists of responsibilities and duties expanded, and they were getting stretched to the limit. Something had to be done. So as we read in verses 2 to 4, we find the 12 apostles stressed about having to take care of business and or ministry. Friends, this is a common predicament of the church throughout time. While we all want to do everything that we can, Resources, both human, financial, and material, are often limited. Many good churches and pastors have burnt out because they tried to do it all or had a hard time saying no to even some good things. So the 12 proposed a solution, a new ministry of sorts, which is often referred to as the deacons. Maybe some of us are familiar with the term deacon which is, of course, another word originating from the Greek, which means 
to serve. Listen to what the apostles said in verses 2 to 4. They said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. See, I find it important to highlight that the apostles aren't by no means suggesting that they were above waiting on tables or serving those in need. That's not at all what they were talking about. Or that somehow deacons are a lesser calling for the less spiritual or that this was a less important ministry of the church. Not at all. Notice the prerequisite for deacons as suggested by the apostles. Men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom. Good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom. This is an important fact that's often ignored. See, the church can't function properly if we don't have the right people doing the right jobs under the right spirit. See, later on, Paul the Apostle, writing to Timothy in the first letter, chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, lays out further qualifications, which are very much the same as the qualifications of pastors. The thing is, it's not a matter of importance of duties, hierarchy of responsibilities, or cravings of power. It's simply doing what the Spirit is calling and prompting us to do. It is as people embrace their calling and are willing to serve under the Spirit's power that the mission of God continues to flourish even when it's faced with challenges. This, friends, is what happened on that day as the early church faced their own growing pains. You see, instead of getting upset because of unjust claims, unfair and unmerited allegations, the apostles' response was considerate and affectionate. They proposed a selection of seven men who would be charged with, notice, not just a task, but with the responsibility for running this important ministry. This is an amazing example for all of us. The apostles willingly gave up power and authority and just handed it over to those who could most benefit the church. They understood that it was not about them. They didn't need to control, micromanage. Instead, they shared authority and responsibility with others. It is interesting to me to notice the names of those men who were chosen. Most of them by their names were likely Hellenistic Jews. Isn't that interesting? Of all those names, we actually may recognize a few. Stephen, which we'll be speaking uh, more about next week, and Philip, who, we, who will later be known as the evangelist, the one who would take the gospel to Samaria, the one who, who would later baptize a eunuch on the side of the road, and who would later help the apostle Paul at Caesarea. But you may wonder at this time, Okay, so what about the apostles? What would they do? What would be their role? And I believe here we find another important lesson for us. See, the apostles knew their limitations. We saw that. But they also knew their calling, their skill set, and their specific role in God's mission. And this is so important. As they say in verse 4, they would focus on, get this, prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer and the ministry of the word. While at times some may dismiss or minimize this part of ministry, this priority of the apostles is actually very, very important. See, they would first focus on prayer, then they would devote themselves to communing, talking, and hearing from God. And then after that, they would spend time in the ministry of the word, witnessing, teaching, preaching, in short, sharing the good news of God's word. As Bible scholar William McDonnell puts it so well, they made it a point of speaking to God about men before talking to men about God. I thought that was really, really good. 
So the question is, what was the result of these changes to the church leadership and how it operated? In other words, what happened to the early church as it, as it faced these growing pains? Well, if verse 7 is any indication, with the help and dedication of the seven, under the wisdom, the power, and the authority of the Holy Spirit, we find a much better, a much healthier church. Verse 7 says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What an amazing example for us. Even us right now, as we continue to face pressures and challenges of a pandemic that is lasting way more than any of us would have imagined. I must say that both Pastor Brian and I relate to this Bible passage actually really, really well. Looking back since COVID-19, it's interesting to see how new challenges and pressures have shaped our roles in ways we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had imagined just a few weeks before it started. I I fear, though, that during these times of isolation, despite our best intentions and effort, some of you maybe feel alone and possibly even ignored by us, just like the widows of the early church. Fortunately, here at GBC, we have a great team of leaders who serve with us. Both our elders and board have been a great support to us. But please let us know if there's any way we can help or support you in any way. The thing is, challenges and opportunities, because they both work together, of COVID-19 keep on mounting. And in the process, sometimes people may fall through the cracks, and we don't want that to happen. As we are restarting our worship gatherings at the chapel, we realize this is a lot more complicated than we had imagined. It's way more complicated than just open church and have a worship service with just a few people. We've decided instead that it is important to connect everyone. So we are investing in live streaming for those who cannot attend here live in person. At the same time, we have developed a brand new small group ministry, a ministry we have been talking and praying for a while now. It's amazing how God works. All of a sudden, new ministries are beginning that we hadn't dreamed a few months ago. We don't yet know how this important ministry will change us, how it will impact our community as good news are proclaimed in our Jerusalem, our Samaria, in our world, all at the same time. But here's the thing. We can't do it all. Pastor Brian, myself, our leadership have been busy working hard, but we need you to help us. We are looking for people who can coordinate and organize groups, operate cameras and AV equipment, produce videos, work on websites, call and visit those who need assistance, lead worship, share a prayer, a reading, or even a sermon. After all, we're all in this together. So today I would like to challenge you. I'd like to challenge you to prayerfully consider how God is actually touching you, talking to you, calling you, and maybe even equipping you to be a part of his kingdom. Right here, right now, as a part of GBC. Just like the apostles, the deacons of the early church, myself, Pastor Brian, the leadership of GBC, God calls everyone as they are, as we are. So today, this call is for all of us. Those who are available, those who are willing those who are open to being shaped by God's Spirit, those who are willing to do what needs to be done so that we can dedicate ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, sharing the good news of God, a God who loves us deeply and who cares for us, for all of us. So today, if you feel convicted, if you want to find out more, please let us know. Raise a hand. Click on a button, connect with us. I pray that as we go forward together as a church, we may be found faithful. May we be counted and amazed as God does what he wants to do among us. Can I get an amen? Amen. God's blessing to you and your family. Have a good rest of the day.